Hello and welcome to Railroad Journeys Around the World. In this volume, we'll be looking at the distinctive railroads of Switzerland. Switzerland is justly famous for its sophisticated railway network, which runs through some of the most dramatic and beautiful mountain scenery in the world. Although it's considerably smaller than the United Kingdom, the whole country is linked by a heavily used and virtually 100% electrified rail network. As we shall see, this colourful and varied multi-gauge system easily connects express and local train services, not only with each other, but also with buses and even lake steamers. This is a country where punctuality is taken for granted and where all but the very smallest stations are staffed. Freight operations too are considerable and varied, ranging from local pickup freights to spectacular international wagon load, block load and intermodal services. However, and despite the environmental consequences for tourism, Switzerland, like nearly all its European neighbours, is currently experiencing considerable difficulties in this area with increased competition from road transport. This is a landlocked neutral country, surrounded by but not a member of the European Union. The core rail network is provided by the state-owned Swiss Federal Railways, whose initials are SBB, CFF or FFS, depending on whether you speak German, French or Italian. But as well as the federal system, there are a considerable number of private railways, 65 to be exact, ranging from a spectacular international main line to a tiny one-vehicle roadside tramway. Proponents of privatisation in Britain often quote the Swiss system as an example of the benefits of private enterprise. But the term private in the Swiss context may be misleading, usually meaning that a so-called private line is financed from cantonal rather than federal sources. Switzerland's prime north-south artery is the St. Gotthard main line. Unfortunately for rail fans, it also happens to be one of the most spectacular and busy main lines in Europe. The lion's share of railborne freight in Switzerland is through traffic, much of it in transit between Germany to the north and Italy to the south. The Swiss, sensibly, don't want their roads clogged with endless lorries grinding through the Alps and insist that the vast majority of through freight must go by rail. The geographical convenience of the St. Gotthard Pass, a transalpine thoroughfare long before the invention of railways, means that many international expresses make use of this route. The end result is a railway paradise, an apparently endless stream of passenger and freight trains through spectacular mountain scenery all day and every day. Plenty of power up front and at the back has always been necessary to lift trains 634 metres in only 28 kilometres between Estfeld and Goschenen. The gradients are slightly less severe on the southern approaches to the tunnel. One of the world's greatest train watching locations is surely from the tiny churchyard in the Alpine village of Vassen. Typically, the railway displays considerably more harmony with its mountain environment than the adjacent Gotthard Autobahn, which has been ruthlessly driven through the valley seemingly without regard to environmental considerations at all. In order to gain height in a limited space, the railway doubles back on itself twice around the village, all three levels being clearly visible from the tiny churchyard. This southbound intermodal service, headed by two state-of-the-art Class 460s, is being assisted by an AE66 Coco Electric, one of a class of 120, specifically designed for the tortuous Gotthard and Samplon route gradients. But we're not finished with this train yet. The line makes a dumbbell curve inside the mountain and reappears still higher and still climbing at an unrelenting 1 in 40. There's barely enough time to realise what a wonderful place this would be to rest in peace before the next train puts in an appearance, this time a northbound mixed freight behind the usual RE66 and RE44 combination.
This northbound passenger train, formed of German stock, is in the hands of an RE66. Basically a stretched RE44 with a bow 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 wheel arrangement. Additional play in the centre bogey means less track wear on the numerous tight curves on this line. 1300 tonnes is the authorised weight for a southbound freight with RE66 and RE44 leading with rear end assistance. The RE66s pack a mighty 10,600 horsepower, more than two UK Class 87s, and when introduced in 1972 were the most powerful single unit electric locomotives in the world. Until recently, the St. Gotthard line used mid-train helper locos, but this practice has now been abandoned in favour of conventional rear-end assistance. Many Gotthard line freights are now in the hands of the ultimate in modern European locomotives, the Class 460 Bobos. Although less powerful in terms of horsepower than an RE66, these locos employ electronic technology and self-steering bogies to increase adhesion and minimise track wear. Don't expect to catch a local passenger train at Basson Station. These were replaced by buses a couple of years ago to create additional paths for rail freight. Although freight activity is often intense during the week, things do quieten down at weekends. Just stroll across the road from the station and look down into the valley and precisely one minute later you'll see the train again, having traversed the lower loop and proceeding down the hill towards Erstfeld and Art Goldau. Modern day RE66s and 460s are a far cry from the early but magnificent crocodiles, one of which is preserved on a plinth at Erstfeld. The figure 2000 on the front of these futuristic locomotives refers to the Bahn 2000 project, whereby the Swiss people voted for a package of nationwide rail improvements, including new locomotives, designed to equip Swiss railways to enter the next century with confidence. Although not without their teething troubles, things seem to have settled down now and Class 460s can be seen all over Switzerland. A new multi-voltage version is under construction for international working and the innovative electronics are creating considerable interest in the export markets. This downhill northbound sports no fewer than four operational Class 460s, no doubt a positioning move for the extra pair. All locos will be generating plenty of extra current using their regenerative braking facility on the downhill run. In less than 10 years, all this scenic action will have come to an end. As part of the Barn 2000 concept, new base level tunnels are to be constructed to improve capacity on the Gotthard and Lochberg routes. Much longer, faster freight trains will operate through a new tunnel stretching 57 kilometres from Estfeld to Biasca. Although the project should mean virtually all transit freight transferring to rail, it will also mean the probable downgrading of this spectacular Alpine rail superhighway. So visit the St. Gotthard while you can. The combined meter gauge networks of the Brig Visp Zermatt, the Forca Oberalp Railway and the extensive Ration Railway combine to create a large system covering much of southeastern Switzerland and a host to the world famous Glacier Express linking the Alpine resorts of Zermatt, Chur and St. Moritz. The Glacier Express has no sleeping cars, crosses no international borders, runs at a sedate average speed of 36 km per hour and thankfully isn't normally associated with murders, espionage or political intrigue. Nevertheless, the Glacier Express is a household name, ranking alongside such world beaters as the Orient Express, the Canadian, the Trans-Siberian and the Indian Pacific.
This westbound working has left Reichen Railways metals at Dysentis and is now climbing steadily up the Vorderheim Valley on the tracks of the Forker Oberalp line. Any Glacier Express formation may well include coaches from all three companies, but favourites are the cream and red liveried air conditioned panorama cars of the Forker Oberalp. The Glacier Express started operations in the 1930s as a summer only service due to the constant danger of avalanche and the fact that the Forker Pass section was closed during the winter anyway. But now, thanks to many millions of Swiss francs investment in the route's infrastructure, passengers queue up to ride the Glacier Express all the year round. If you travel the whole Glacier Express route, you'll cross no less than 290 bridges and pass through 91 tunnels. This presumes, of course, that you've reserved your seat in advance, and that even applies in the dining car too. On Ration railway metals, Glacier Express workings are normally strengthened by a number of ordinary coaches. The Ration has no rack sections, enabling heavier and longer trains to run. With the charisma surrounding the Glacier Express, it's easy to forget that the same lines are served by numerous normal service trains at regular intervals. Many travellers actually prefer the service trains, where the windows open to admit the aromatic alpine air. And as Glacier Express workings enjoy absolute priority over the single line, on local trains passengers are sometimes treated to a 5 or 10 minute unofficial photo stop at a glorious remote mountain location while waiting for the road. With an environment like this to build a railway through, it's little wonder that rack railways, where a cog on the underside of the locomotive engages a toothed rail on the track, was a Swiss development. The Fourca Oberalp is one of 12 combined rack and adhesion lines in Switzerland. At the start or finish of a rack and pinion section, trains must reduce speed to a crawl to ensure the cog wheels are properly engaged. Modern trains, as well as using conventional air brakes, also utilise braking systems which employ the rack and pinion for the benefit of both ascending and descending trains. Electric traction first appeared around the turn of the century on several Swiss lines, although the Fourca Oberalp wasn't electrified until 1942, 18 years after its opening in 1926. Electrification is at 11 kilovolts, 16 hertz AC. The same voltage is on the neighbouring BVZ and Ration systems. This eastbound train on the climb to the Oberalp Pass is headed by a modern HGE 44 loco, built by the SLM ABB conglomerate in 1989. The relatively frequent stopping train service means that it's possible to use the railway to access the most magnificent alpine scenery for walking or other mountain pursuits. Comparatively speaking, local fares aren't that expensive. In particular, the well-publicised Swiss Rail Pass, giving unlimited travel on railways, post buses, trams and steamers, are valid on these lines and provide excellent value. Ration Railway's extensive network joins up with the Forca Oberalp metals at Dysentis. In terms of mileage, the Ration is Switzerland's largest private railway company. Although it has severe gradients, it employs only adhesion. No rack and pinion working here. Despite employing meter gauge throughout, this is very much a modern mainline railway, serving the whole of southeastern Switzerland. The Reichen Railway also connects with the Swiss Federal at Landbart, the two railways running roughly parallel from Coeur. The regular interval RE44 hauled expresses to destinations as diverse as Hamburg, Brussels and Graz pause here on their way to or from Coeur to connect with the meter gauge line which serves local villages between the two towns. The 
red livery is the most recent paint scheme applied to the RE44 and RE66 locomotives. Of course, there are still plenty around in the rather drab all-over green livery, with coaching stock to match. Landquart is home to the Ration Railways workshops, and much of the system's extensive freight operations are centred here too. It's possible to travel from Coeur to St. Moritz either via Tusis or the slightly longer but more scenic journey via the world-famous skiing resorts of Klosters and Davos, the two routes juxtaposing at Filisaur for the unforgettable run over the Albula Pass to Samadan and St. Moritz. The section from Landquart to Klosters and Davos is particularly busy in winter, with a great many passengers weighted down with skis and luggage, transferring between standard and meter gauge trains at Landquart. If you travel via Tusis, shortly before reaching Filisur, you'll pass over the famous curving Landwasser viaduct, the subject of many official publicity photographs. The fact that the Ration Railway is no backwards narrow gauge setup, but an important main line, is evidenced by its fleet list. 63 electric locos at the last count, 9 diesels, 3 steamers, 43 electric rail cars, 320 passenger coaches and 1,159 freight wagons. Routes from Coeur via Davos and Tusis rejoin at the village of Filisur, which, as well as being an excellent centre for walking in the Grisson, is an ideal base for railway holidays. This Davos line train is arriving behind standard GE442 number 629. As well as operating busy passenger services, it comes as a surprise to learn that the Ration Railway is very active in the freight business too. Passenger services do take priority and train dispatching staff often have their work cut out, fitting freight trains in over the already busy single line. Small consignments of less than wagon load nature are conveyed, as well as the more usual bulk commodities. The mixed freight, or cargo domicile zug, is the backbone of the line's traffic. The variety of cargo carried is enormous, ranging from daily needs like food and milk through to beer, mineral water, raw materials and building products inbound to the canton. Another of the Ration Railway's lines electrified on a non-standard DC system is the line south from St. Moritz to Tirano in Italy, over the famed Bernina Pass, and which formed yet another of Switzerland's unforgettable scenic rail journeys. Having climbed without rack assistance to an altitude of over 2,000 metres, the railway passes through an almost eerie landscape, surrounded by the snow-covered peaks of the Bernina group of mountains. We're well above the tree line here, and only the very hardiest grasses and alpine flowers can survive. The summit at Ospizio Bernina, standing high at 2,253 metres, marks the start of the scenic southerly descent, well away from the parallel Bernina Pass Road. It's well worth breaking your journey to enjoy some walking or lineside photography in this area. Like all Swiss railways, great and small, there's a regular interval service, including the Bernina Express, which offers through coaches to Coeur. Once past the icy Lake Bianco, the railway curves sharply to the right, the gradient stiffens, and the tortuous descent begins. The line descends from Alpgrum to Poschavio on a gradient of 1 in 14, which qualified the Bernina Bahn as one of the world's steepest adhesion-only lines. The terrain necessitates so many twists and curves that the train will travel over double the direct distance of a straight route between the two stations. The descent is so steep that the barren upland is quickly left behind, as the line is now dropping through pine forests, in stark contrast to the landscape traversed only a few minutes previously. No less than five horseshoe loops in tunnels and an endless succession of curves eventually brings the line within sight of the town of Poshavio, a pleasant country town where the Bernina Line's workshops are situated. A distinct change in architecture towards an Italianate style is now apparent, 
hardly surprising, as we're now not far from the Italian border. This train is headed by loco number 802, one of the Ration's two electro diesels. They normally work as straight 1000 volt DC electrics on the Bernina Bahn, but can operate over the whole system on engineers' trains using their Cummins 463 kilowatt diesel engines. As the border draws nearer, the line passes the small town of Bruzio, where a step in the valley floor is negotiated by means of the famous open spiral on a sharply curved stone viaduct. A good appreciation of this novel engineering feature can be had from the centre of the spiral itself, as both uphill and downhill trains loop the loop here on their way to or from Tirano. Train speeds seem surprisingly high, considering the tight curvature and almost surreal ascending gradient. But the narrow gauge is what makes railways through mountain terrain like this possible, and its capabilities are demonstrated to great effect on the Bernina Bahn. Once again, it's worth emphasizing that this sort of line-side photography can be done without a car. This location is within easy walking distance of Bruzio Station, and armed with a Swiss pass or a local Graubunden regional pass, this corner of Italian-speaking Switzerland is well worth exploring. As well as numerous small private railways and the extensive ration system, Switzerland also boasts a private main line, the bern lochberg samplon route, from the Swiss capital through the Lechberg and Samplon tunnels to Doma d'Ossola in Italy. It's not quite as busy as the Gotthard, but there's plenty of both passenger and freight activity, as well as through workings of SBB locos, as evidenced by this RE44 and RE66 combination on a northbound freight, crossing the Kander Viaduct outside Frutigen. The scenery is, of course, exceptional, but this route is likely to be downgraded, presuming plans to construct a Lochberg-based tunnel go ahead. Many trains on the BLS are in the hands of Swiss Federal Locos, such as this Class 460 in all-over advertising livery. A number of this class are similarly treated, advertising such goodies as cheese, photo products, model railways and dairy produce. The BLS has a large fleet of its own Locos, which regularly stray over Swiss Federal metals. Flagships are the BLS version of the Class 460, classified Class 465. They're identical in most respects, but are more powerful, delivering 7,000 kilowatts as opposed to the Class 460's 6,100. Typical of the many varied and colourful trains on this line is this RE66 hauled express, formed of coaches from the BLS, the Swiss Federal, as well as the national systems of both Belgium and Italy. All trains stop at the mountain resort of Kandersteg, located at the top of the Kander Valley. This train is headed by one of the BLS-owned designed RE44s, the line's staple power until the arrival of the Class 465s. Even now, these distinctive engines are much in evidence. They're mainly on freight workings these days. The BLS has capitalised on its rail operation through the Lochberg as a shortcut for motorists by operating Pendelzug car carrying shuttle trains. The alternative to the short train ride is a lengthy diversion on the Autobahn by the St. Gotthard or the Rhone Valley. Loading is quick and easy, using flat wagons with fold down sides marshalled at each end of the train, which enables motor coaches to be conveyed as well as cars and caravans. Motive power is almost invariably one of the BLS RE44 Bobos, marshalled at the Kandersteg end, with a driving trailer at the southerly Goppenstein end of the train. The 
whole operation here is run with considerably less fuss than the Channel Tunnel car carrying service. There's nothing like the Eurotunnel infrastructure and the rolling stock is basic and functional for the 20 minute journey. During the short wait to load, you might be lucky enough to catch a glimpse of one of the BLS's twin unit AE88 heavy freight locos, which still regularly haul international freights between Basel and Brig. It's not necessary to book in advance, and even at peak summer weekends, waits are not too bad. Fares are surprisingly reasonable and well worth the saving in driving time that this operation makes possible. Departures are half hourly, with most trains running to Goppenstein at the tunnel's south end. Some trains do, however, continue through the Samplon tunnel to the Italian border at Isel, and are of particular benefit to tourists from northern Europe heading for the Mediterranean sun. The Pendelsuk trains are hardly the most photogenic in the world, with the driving trailers being converted former EMU cars. In any case, they can only be seen in daylight on the short stretches between Kandersteg and Goppenstein stations and the tunnel portals, except of course for those trains which run through to Isel. Unlike the Channel Tunnel, motorists must stay in their cars, and once in the tunnel you're in total darkness. Time for a rest, a chat or a brief snooze, or to consult the Swiss National Timetable to plan the next Grice. The southern end of the tunnel is here at Goppenstein, where most car shuttles terminate. This pair of Swiss Federal Locos are heading a lengthy train of vans which will now begin the spectacular descent of the Lochberg south ramp towards Brig. Much of Switzerland's magnificent scenery is inaccessible other than by public transport, be it train, post bus, steamer, cable car or funicular. And anyway, who wants to concentrate on the driving when you could be admiring scenery like this? Switzerland is a walker's paradise, as well as a rail fans, and mountain paths are clearly signposted from stations and bus stops. Accommodation ranges from five-star international hotels to country guest houses, but whatever your price range, you can be certain of high standards and comfort. English isn't all that widely spoken, but it's usually possible to make yourself understood. After all, the Swiss tourist industry is largely dependent on visitors from abroad. Prices are considerably higher than in the UK, but economies can be made by avoiding the fashionable jet-set resorts and high summer or the peak skiing season. It's not an exaggeration to say once again that Switzerland is one of the very few countries where it's simply not necessary to own a car, and public transport provides a genuine and realistic alternative. You can even hire a bike at larger stations and drop it off at another for a small extra charge. At some stations it's possible to buy groceries or fruit, or patronise one of many excellent station buffets. Many trains have dining cars, or at least a trolley service of drinks and snacks, but on-train prices are definitely top of the range. Travellers wanting to explore further than the end of the platform are advised to acquire a copy of Switzerland by Rail, one of Brad Publication's excellent series on exploring the world by train. The book describes each line and its stations, as well as the more interesting connecting journeys by other forms of transport. Zürich Hauptbahnhof could be said to be the hub of the Swiss rail system, and the area around the station is positively heaving with tramcars, as indeed are all the major Swiss cities. The Swiss are proud of their railways. Still, a British loco of sorts does at least get a look in, if only on a cigarette advert. The Hauptbahnhof itself has 20 odd platforms, with more underground and an extremely complex track layout which is never quiet. But this is Switzerland, and delays or platform alterations are very much the exception. 
Many suburban services, which start running at 5.30 in the morning, are formed of double-deck coaches worked push-pull by Class 450 Bobos, a Class 460 variant designed specifically for outer suburban work in the Zurich area. The DFB currently operates from its Rialp base to the eastern end of the original Forker Tunnel, through scenery strangely reminiscent of some of the wilder parts of Scotland. These rack-fitted 260 tanks are based at Rialp in southern Switzerland and are ex-mainline Fuca Oberalp Railway, dating from 1914. When the line was fully electrified in 1942, a number of steam engines, including this pair, were sold to Vietnam. These two locos were repatriated in 1990, no doubt feeling more at home in the alpine drizzle than the steamy Vietnamese jungle. Together with a former Brig Vest Zermatt loco, they now work one of the most exciting preserved lines in Europe, the Dampfbahn Furka Bergstrecke, or Furka Steam Mounted Railway, usually known simply as the DFB. The preservation scheme here was formed initially in 1983, when a group of Swiss and German rail fans set about restoring the original Furka Oberalp main line over the Furka Pass. Although still in relative infancy, the DFB has quickly gained a reputation for excellence, due largely to its original and authentic motive power and its magnificent setting. The steam operation from Rialp is a direct result of the Swiss government's willingness to invest in a new 15.5 km furka based tunnel for use by mainline traffic. It was the intention of the operators to abandon the steeply graded electrified rack line from Rialp to Furka, which is now used for steam haulage as soon as the new tunnel, which is the longest meter gauge tunnel in the world, opened in 1982. The car and coach carrying shuttle trains are similar to those we've already seen on the BLS operation. It's perhaps surprising that it took until the early 1970s to start to build the tunnel. While the Forker Oberalp's main line east from Brig is truly magnificent, this is of little consequence if the line is blocked by snow for months on end, preventing both road and rail movement altogether. The opening of the single bore base tunnel has aided both road and rail travellers, as for much of the time it is the only available way to travel the short distance between Oberwald and Rialp. The provision of the tunnel has enabled the Glacier Express and other trains to operate all year, although some stopping trains do terminate here at Oberwald, the western end of the tunnel. When the tunnel was first opened, the Forker Oberalp had no desire to retain the Bergstrecker, its mountain section. That it's possible today to travel over part of the original Forker route is due to the foresight of the group of enthusiasts who saw the winning potential of a steam-operated tourist operation over the pass. The operating season runs from mid-June to early October, though some trains operate only at weekends. Conditions in wintertime are so bad that some section of the line, including this bridge, originally had to be dismantled each autumn to avoid being swept away by flash floods or avalanche. Even during the operating season, poor weather can sometimes mean trains having to terminate at the halfway loop here at Tiefenbach, where passengers get time for a few quick snaps while the locomotive takes water. Although the original Forker Pass Road is still open to road traffic during the summer and is just visible from the line, it's virtually impossible to access the line side for photography. 
Recognising this, the DFB operate photographers' specials on several days each season, including run pasts in time-honoured fashion at the most scenic parts of the line. The Reichen Railway operate three steam locomotives for excursion and charter work. This 1906 built 280 leaving the depot at Samadun near to St Moritz is kept in pristine condition by the Reichen's engineers, just like the rest of their fleet. Today, number 108 is working a Sunday public excursion from Samadan to School Tarasp in the Engadin, one of the Russians less well known but in some ways most attractive routes. The carefully planned itinerary includes a lunch stop as well as a couple of photographic run pasts and was certainly well patronised despite the limited load of only four coaches. The route keeps close to the north side of the River Inn Valley and for the most part is paralleled by a good road, allowing fairly easy chasing, although the meter gauge 280 has a not unimpressive turn of speed. The Appenzell Canton in northeast Switzerland is almost completely undiscovered by visitors from outside the country, but is extremely attractive and offers many kilometres of superb walking and cycling, the majority of which is accessible by the Appenzellerbahn network, forming a circle of lines into the area from St Gallen and Herisau. The rural way of life, with many of the local farmers only producing very limited amounts of milk for cheese, really hasn't changed for centuries. Strange then that its citizens should be amongst some of the richest and most privileged in Europe. Services start at first light and continue late into the evening, though it must be said early and late trains are only very sparsely patronised. The Appenzellerbahn is not entirely worked by railcars. This GE44 machine was completed in 1994, weighs 47 tonnes and has a permitted top speed of 75 kilometres per hour. It's perhaps rather fortunate for number crunchers that the Appenzellerbahn has only one locomotive, for the running number 51 is so small as to be almost unreadable, unless you're underneath the loco. A much more typical Appenzellerbahn formation is this three-car train climbing away from Appenzeller itself, the capital of the small canton, towards the junction station of Geis. What could be described as the Appenzellerbahn's main line runs from Geis to the city of St Gallen. In the suburb of Teufen, the line gets fed up with running at the side of the road and decides to run in the middle of it instead. Nobody really seems to mind the trains snaking through the main street every 15 minutes or so. This section of the line carries a heavy commuter traffic into St Gallen from various suburbs and most trains are well patronised, particularly at peak periods. The southwest corner of Switzerland near Lake Geneva has some of the most dramatic lines in the country.
This brig to Geneva Airport Express, hauled by RE44 number 11266, is arriving at Eigel, an historic Rhone Valley town in the French-speaking Valais Canton. As well as being a busy, attractive station in its own right with all the usual facilities, Eigel is the junction station for no less than three separate meter gauge lines, all of which share a tramway-style terminus in the station forecourt. No need for dedicated bay platforms here. The attractive blue and white trains belong to the Eigel Les Diablerets line while the red and white cars are those of the neighbouring Eigel Champery Railway. Carrying milk, post and newspapers as well as passengers, all three lines play an important part in the local transport scene. The Eigel Les Diablerets line is an adhesion-only line climbing through the Ormont Valley to the all-year-round resort which gives its name to the railway. All three lines operating from here are operated by a common management and a regional pass is available, which also covers the nearby Bex Vila meter gauge line. All three lines negotiate the streets of Eigel before making their way to their respective destinations. Eigel Town Centre is attractive, largely pedestrianised and well worth exploring. The town's history dates back to Roman times, and Eigel is the centre of local winemaking, as well as being an ideal base for touring this largely undiscovered corner of southern Switzerland. Huh? Gliding through the streets on a modern, warm electric train is certainly a novel method of window shopping. The attractive chocolate and cream belongs to the Eigel Lazin line, the shortest, steepest and most scenic of Eigel's three meter gauge lines. Once out of town, the rack and pinion is engaged and climbing begins in earnest. The line climbs steeply, first through vineyards and then through pine forests towards the resort of Lysin. Despite the twisting and tortuous nature of alternative road transport, this line was under serious threat of closure in the 1970s, although thankfully this now seems to have receded. This is Lysin Village Station, the first of three stations serving the resort. It marks the end of the single track section, though certainly not the end of the climb. If you think the view from here is good, you'd be right, but it gets even better. The double track section beyond the village station is one of the steepest rack sections in the whole of Switzerland and is on a completely new alignment from the original single track route, which is now a footpath. The line owes its existence to people's poor health as Lysin was originally a health resort and the railway was constructed as an extension to Eigel's tramways to enable those suffering from tuberculosis and other diseases to reach Lysin's sanitaria more easily. Only since the war, and in particular since the relocation of an American school here in 1962, has Lysin become one of Switzerland's top winter sports resorts. The western part of the Glacier Express operates over the Brig Visp Zermattbahn. This train shares Brig Station Forecourt with the Forca Oberalp Railway outside the main SBB BLS Junction Station. The BVZ is one of Switzerland's busiest meter gauge lines, with through coaches operating between Chur and Zermatt over Ration, Forca Oberalp and BVZ Metals. Zermatt is one of nine traffic-free villages in Switzerland 
and if you're coming by road, it's necessary to leave your car at Tash, the line's penultimate station. The large car and coach parks here are hardly sympathetic to the scenery, but are necessary to preserve the traffic-free village environment of Zermatt. The train service over the last few kilometres to Zermatt is very much enhanced, with a considerable number of additional trains shuttling back and forth between Zermatt and Tash, as the railway is the only means of getting to Zermatt other than walking. Following the Mata Vispo River, the line has seen considerable investment over the last 20 years, mainly in signalling alterations to increase capacity over the single track, and of course in continuing protection against the ever present threat of avalanche. Zermatt station itself has been completely rebuilt and modernised. The design incorporates a high degree of protection from the weather, including avalanches. Transport to the town's many hotels is by means of small electric trolleys, or in the case of the major luxury hotels, by horse-drawn carriage. A network of mountain railways and cable cars makes it possible to explore well beyond the town into the surrounding mountains. The main route upwards out of Zermatt is the Gornegratbahn, Switzerland's oldest rack railway. The line owes much of its popularity to the fact that it runs within sight of the infamous Matterhorn for much of its length, as well as being the most practical route to the numerous ski runs above Zermatt. Opened in 1898, it's been electrified from the start. As well as the Matterhorn itself, it's possible to see 29 of Switzerland's 34 highest mountain peaks from the summit. The line terminates in Europe's highest open-air railway station. During the summer months, weekly early morning excursions are operated to enable visitors to watch the sun rise over the mountains. This area became popular with tourists as early as 1865 following British mountaineer Edward Wimper's party becoming the first to conquer the Matterhorn. His expedition achieved notoriety after four of his team plunged to their ends during the descent, ironically creating publicity for this beautiful corner of southern Switzerland. Montreux is a good centre from which to explore several attractive mountain railway systems, including the Montreux Oberlandbahn. This imposing building is the main SBB station at Montreux, a fashionable resort town on the north shore of Lake Geneva, and home to the famous jazz and comedy festivals. Entrance is at street level, but the Geneva Brig Valley trunk route runs at a higher level behind the main building. This eastbound International Express, on its way to Italy, has originated at Geneva Airport and is headed by our old friend the SBB Class 460 in Tilsit livery, promoting a particularly tasty cheese. Here, another conventionally liveried Class 460 heads a westbound International Express formed of Italian stock. One of the omnipresent class RBDE 44 EMUs, known officially as New Shuttle Trains and unofficially as Hummingbirds, leaves Montreux with an eastbound Rhone Valley stopping service. Montreux is also the southern end of the Montreux Oberland Bahn, the spectacular meter gauge line from Zweisimmen in the Bernese Oberland. Trains terminate alongside the mainline platform allowing easy interchange with SBB services from Geneva, Lausanne and Brig, amongst other places. A very typical MOB formation is this train, with ABDE 88 twin motor coaches hauling three trailers. 
These powerful units were built in the late 60s and can operate alone, with trailers or even hauling freight or departmental wagons. We're riding in the cab of one of the MOB's 1983-built GDE 44s on a Zimmern bound train near the top of the long climb from Montreux. Some of the engines are painted in liveries to match the luxury Panoramic Express coaches, though in fact they can and do work any train on the system. Chambly is easily identified by its unusual and distinctive island platform building. It's also the junction for the museum line to Blonay, which runs steam specials at summer weekends. Recently introduced over the preserved line are weekday commuter services from Blonay to Montreux in a welcome initiative by all parties involved. This new GE44S heads a Montreux bound train past the island platform. Deservedly one of Switzerland's most popular train journeys, it must surely take its place near the top of the list of the world's classic scenic railways. The line is timetabled for optimum capacity, making use of most of the crossing loops on the way. Another of the new GE44s is heading a Montreux-bound panoramic express. Les Avants is the outer terminus for the vertical suburban service for Montreux. Typical of Swiss practice is the retention of older vehicles for departmental and snow clearance work. Leaving Les Avants, another of the ABDE 88 twin sets heads back to Montreux with two trailers and a dead BDE 44 motor coach at the rear. After Les Avants, the line climbs at its steepest gradient of 1 in 13.7, first through beech woods and then through pine forest. Curvature is constant, as is the sound of squealing flanges. There are numerous avalanche shelters, which help to guard against this ever-present threat, as well as helping to keep the most susceptible section of line clear of heavy snow. As if the scenery weren't breathtaking enough, a scheme is being developed which will allow through running of MOB trains beyond Zweisimmen to Spitz, Interlaken and Lucerne, opening up an almost unlimited potential for connectional possibilities, with many changes of train eliminated. The work involves converting the standard gauge line from Zweisimmen to Spitz and Interlaken Ost to dual gauge by the simple expedient of laying a third rail. You'll not have failed to notice the sudden change to snowy conditions. In fact, once the line has passed its summit and begins the descent to Zweisimmen, it's not unusual to encounter a sudden change in the weather like this one. This train is formed of two trailers propelled by one of the BE44 motor coaches delivered in the late 70s and intended for local services. Conditions for line-side photography can be every bit as good, if not better, during the winter months than those encountered during the middle of the year. But don't think you'll get cheaper accommodation travelling off-season. Thanks to the popularity of winter sports, particularly in this area, the skiing season is regarded as the busiest time and accommodation is very much at a premium. For a line which was intended from the start to serve the tourist industry, it is perhaps not surprising that the MOB have been pioneers in the concept of luxury train travel, and with scenery this good as your main marketing asset, then the idea was always going to be a winner. The MOB first started operating luxury trains in 1931 with the construction of magnificent Pullman cars. Unfortunately, the depression of the 30s and wartime robbed the train of its clientele and the coaches were sold to the Ration Railway in 1939, where they still run on special occasions. The 
the first prototype panoramic coach appeared in the mid-1970s, which, together with some refurbished vehicles, formed the Panoramic Express, which commenced running in 1978. Originally called the Super Panoramic, the upmarket Golden Panoramic features driving trailers offering passengers uninterrupted views of scenery and the line ahead. Traction is provided by a 6000 series GD444, painted in matching blue and cream livery, marshalled in mid-train. The driver is positioned in a rather small cabin in the roof of the leading coach. As visibility from his position is rather limited, video cameras are placed in strategic positions on the body side to aid his observation. The concept of a view out of the front of a moving train, once such an enjoyable feature of British DMUs, has been abandoned in the UK in a crass display of management short-sightedness. As you can see, once again, the Swiss display their total professionalism in this respect, but at a price. Not only are supplements payable on top of the first-class fare, but advance reservations for these prime seats are absolutely essential. Even if you can't get seats in the end coaches, conditions in the rest of the train are pretty exceptional, with luxurious interiors, panoramic roof windows and easily available refreshments. I do hope that you've enjoyed this look at the unique railroads of this fascinating country. Bye for now. in favour of conventional rear-end assistance. Many Gotthard line freights are now in the hands of the ultimate in modern European locomotives, the Class 460 Bobos. Although less powerful in terms of horsepower than an RE66, these locos employ electronic technology and self-steering bogies to increase adhesion and minimise track wear. Don't expect to catch a local passenger train at Basson Station. These were replaced by buses a couple of years ago to create additional paths for rail freight. Although freight activity is often intense during the week, things do quieten down at weekends. Just stroll across the road from the station and look down into the valley and precisely one minute later you'll see the train again having traversed the lower loop and proceeding down the hill towards Erstfeld and Arth Goldau. Modern day RE66s and 460s are a far cry from the early but magnificent crocodiles, one of which is preserved on a plinth at Erstfeld. The figure 2000 on the front of these futuristic locomotives refers to the Bahn 2000 project, whereby the Swiss people voted for a package of nationwide rail improvements, including new locomotives, designed...
Hello and welcome to Railroad Journeys Around the World. In this volume, we'll be looking at the distinctive railroads of Switzerland. Switzerland is justly famous for its sophisticated railway network, which runs through some of the most dramatic and beautiful mountain scenery in the world. Although it's considerably smaller than the United Kingdom, the whole country is linked by a heavily used and virtually 100% electrified rail network. As we shall see, this colourful and varied multi-gauge system easily connects express and local train services, not only with each other, but also with buses and even lake steamers. This is a country where punctuality is taken for granted and where all but the very smallest stations are staffed. Freight operations too are considerable and varied, ranging from local pickup freights to spectacular international wagon load, block load and intermodal services however, and despite the ensemble on route gradients. But we're not finished with this train yet. The line makes a dumbbell curve inside the mountain and reappears still higher and still climbing at an unrelenting 1 in 40. There's barely enough time to realise what a wonderful place this would be to rest in peace before the next train puts in an appearance, this time a northbound mixed freight behind the usual RE66 and RE44 combination. This northbound passenger train, formed of German stock, is in the hands of an RE66, basically a stretched RE44 with a bow, bow, bow wheel arrangement. Additional play in the centre bogey means less track wear on the numerous tight curves on this line. 1300 tonnes is the authorised weight for a southbound freight with RE66 and RE44 leading with rear end assistance. The RE66s pack a mighty 10,600 horsepower more than two UK Class 87s, and when introduced in 1972 were the most powerful single-unit electric locomotives in the world. Until recently, the St. Gotthard line used mid-train helper locos, but this practice has now been a biographical convenience of the St. Gotthard Pass, a transalpine thoroughfare long before the invention of railways, means that many international expresses make use of this route. The end result is a railway paradise, an apparently endless stream of passenger and freight trains through spectacular mountain scenery all day and every day. Plenty of power up front and at the back has always been necessary to lift trains 634 metres in only 28 kilometres between Estfeld and Goshenen. The gradients are slightly less severe on the southern approaches to the tunnel. One of the world's greatest train watching locations is surely from the tiny churchyard in the alpine village of Vassen. Typically, the railway displays considerably more harmony with its mountain environment than the adjacent Gotthard Autobahn, which has been ruthlessly driven through the valley seemingly without regard to environmental considerations at all. In order to gain height in a limited space, the railway doubles back on itself twice around the village, all three levels being clearly visible from the tiny churchyard. This southbound intermodal service, headed by two state-of-the-art class 460s, is being assisted by an AE66 Coco Electric, one of a class of 120 specifically designed for the tortuous Gotthard environmental consequences for tourism, Switzerland, like nearly all its European neighbours, is currently experiencing considerable difficulties in this area with increased competition from road transport. This is a landlocked neutral country, surrounded by but not a member of the European Union. The core rail network is provided by the state-owned Swiss Federal Railways, whose initials are SBB, CFF or FFS, depending on whether you speak German, French or Italian. But as well as the federal system, there are a considerable number of private railways, 65 to be exact, ranging from a spectacular international main line to a tiny one-vehicle roadside tramway. 
Proponents of privatization in Britain often quote the Swiss system as an example of the benefits of private enterprise. But the term private in the Swiss context may be misleading, usually meaning that a so-called private line is financed from cantonal rather than federal sources. Switzerland's prime north-south artery is the St. Gotthard main line. Unfortunately for rail fans, it also happens to be one of the most spectacular and busy main lines in Europe. The lion's share of railborne freight in Switzerland is through traffic, much of it in transit between Germany to the north and Italy to the south. The Swiss, sensibly, don't want their roads clogged with endless lorries grinding through the Alps and insist that the vast majority of through freight must go by rail. The G2 